we'll do we'll do five Edgar Allan Poe poems tonight. Closing on the Raven and starting with the Valley of Unrest. you all settled down nicely and comfortably, I'll get into the show. The Valley of Unrest. Once it smiled a silent dell, where the people did not dwell. They had gone unto the wards, trusting to the mild-eyed stars, nightly from their azure towers to keep watch above the flowers, in the midst of which all day the red sunlight lazily lay. Now each visitor shall confess the sad valley's restlessness. Nothing there is motionless, nothing save the airs that brood over the magic solitude. Ah, by no wind are stirred those trees that palpitate like the chill seas around the misty Hebrides. Ah, by no wind those clouds are driven that rustle through the unquiet heaven uneasily from morn till even over the violets that lie in myriad types of the human eye, over the lilies there that wave and weep above a nameless grave. They wave, from out their fragrant tops eternal dews come down in drops. They weep, from off their delicate stems perennial tears descend in gems. So there we have it. The Valley of Unrest. Nice atmospheric tale to start us with. I think next up, yeah. I think we'll do the sleeper, shall we? Let's do the sleeper. Thank you, thank you. At midnight in the month of June, I stand beneath the mystic moon. An opiate vapour, dewy, dim, exhales from out her golden rim, and softly dripping drop by drop upon the quiet mountain top, steals drowsily and musically into the universal valley. The rosemary nods upon the grave, the lily lolls upon the wave, wrapping the fog around its breast, the ruin moulders into rest. Looking like Leith Sea, the lake, a conscious slumber seems to take, and would not for the world awake. All beauty sleeps, and lo, where lies her casement open to the skies. Irene with her destinies. O oh, lady bright, can it be right? This window open to the night. The wanton airs from the treetop, laughingly through the lattice drop. The bodiless airs, a wizard root, flirt through the chamber in and out. And wave the curtain canopy so fitfully, so fearfully, above the closed and fringed lid, neath where thy slumbering soul lies hid, that o'er the floor and down the wall, like ghosts, the shadows rise and fall. O oh, lady dear, hast thou no fear? Why and what art thou dreaming here? Sure thou art come o'er far seas, a wonder to these garden trees. Strange is thy pallor, strange thy dress, strange above all, thy length of tress, and this is all solemn silentness. The lady sleeps. Oh, may her sleep, which is enduring so be deep. Heaven have her in its sacred keep, this chamber changed for one more holy, this bed for one more melancholy. I pray to God that she may lie forever with an opened eye, while the dim-sheeted ghosts go by. My love, she sleeps. Oh, may her sleep, as it is lasting so deep, 
Soft may the worms about her creep far in the forest dim and old. For her may some tall vault unfold, some vault that oft hath flung its back, and winged panels fluttering back, triumphant o'er the crusted poles of her grand family funerals. Some sepulchre, remote, alone, against whose portal she hath thrown in childhood many an idle stone, some tomb from whose sounding door she ne'er shall force an echo more. Thrilling to think, poor child of sin, it was the dead who groaned within. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you like listening to, to a Brit reading American poetry. Um, we, should, we should get some American poets on here uh, reading some, some British poetry. I think it would be nice. Uh, but yes, yes, I, I do. I do like... I have to... I do like my American poets a little bit more than I know the US poets. Uh, I've got some nice Frank O'Hara and John Bowman down... Actually, John Bowman downstairs or up here? Frank O'Hara and John Bowman are downstairs. T.S. Eliot is, is up here. And it's at that point that I'm realising that most of my poetry collection is actually, apart from the Tennyson, Byron, and I tell you what, I should get my Tennyson up here because you guys would love the uh, Tennyson copy that I've got downstairs. Um, yeah, most of it seems to be American. I uh, have to hand it to you guys. It's a lot more conversational poetry. It just seems to be better to read aloud, with the exception of that great Yorkshireman Ted Hughes. Tennyson's awesome. T Tennyson and Hughes, and they're both northerners, so northern poets within England, uh, rock, going down south, we, well, whenever you go down south, things tend to tail off a bit. I'm joking, for those of you who are from the south, I love the south, um, and, and I've got some David Harsons, and I think David Harsons southerner, right up here, so I like all types of poetry, but anyone who's nice and conversational wins. Anyway. Let's move on to our next poem of the evening. Oh, and Baudelaire. Love a good bit of Baudelaire. Who doesn't like some Baudelaire? Uh, I, I might go and do some Baudelaire another night. That's, that's quite nice and gothic and grotesque, isn't it? But let's go on to... Not the Raven, but that other poem featuring that famous name. Lenore. Ah! Broken is the golden bowl, the spirit flown for ever. Let the bell toll, a saintly soul fee floats on the Stygian river. And, Guy de Ver, hast thou no tear? Weep now or never more? See, on yon drear and rigid bier, thou lies thy love, Lenore. Come, let the burial rite be read, the funeral song be sung. An anthem for the queenliest dead that ever died so young. A dirge for her, the doubly dead, in that she died so young. Wretches! Ye loved her more for her wealth, and hated her for her pride. And when she fell in feeble health, ye blessed her that she died. How shall the ritual then be read, the requiem how be sung? By you, by yours, the evil eye, by yours, the slanderous tongue, that did to death the innocent that died, and died so young. Persavimus, but rave not thus, and let a Sabbath song go up to God so solemnly the dead may feel no wrong. That sweet Lenore hath gone before with hope that flew beside, leaving thee wild for the dear child that should have been thy bride. For her, the fair and debonair that now so lowly lies, the life upon her yellow hair, but not within her eyes. The life still there upon her hair, the death upon her eyes. Avant, tonight my heart is light, no dirge will I appraise, but waft the angel on her flight with a pan of the old days. Let no bell toll, lest her sweet soul, amid its hallowed mirth, should catch the note as it doth float up 
from the damned earth, to friends above, from friends below, the indignant ghost is riven. From hell unto a higher state far up within the heaven, from grief and groan to a golden throne beside the king of heaven. Oh, this is so much fun! I haven't done these poems in years. It is brilliant to be getting back into them, and with you here as well to listen to it. And now, oh, we're on our, onto our penultimate poem of this session. I think I'm going to go. So many good choices here. So many good choices. Hello, Screen Wax. Thank you. Thank you. We're about to. We've got two more poems to go, and we've still got the ultimate poem of the night. That's right. The Raven is still to come, Screen Wax. So we've still got that to look forward to. I am going to go for Silence because it's a sonnet, and I like sonnets. Sonnets are my favourite forms of poems. Um, actually, I prefer Petrarchan sonnet. I've got a lovely, he says, he says, taking a moment. I picked this up, um, I was in London last month, and I picked up uh, a copy of Petrarch's sonnet. Very, very exciting to uh, actually read those. Haven't opened those ones yet. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe we'll do some Petrarchan sonnets uh, at another time. Maybe we'll do some Petrarchan, actually, Let's do some Petrarchan sonnets tomorrow because I haven't had a chance to get into these poems yet and it gives me an excuse to read them if I've got you guys here to listen to them. But before we get to those sonnets and before we get to the raven where we'll finish up tonight, let's get into silence. There are some qualities, some incorporate things that have a double life which thus is made. A twin of that twin entity which springs from matter and light evinced in solid and shade. There is a twofold, silence, sea and shore, body and soul. One dwells in lonely places, newly with grass o'ergrown, some solemn graces, some human memories and tearful law render him terrorless, his name's no more. He is the corporate silence. Dread him not. No power hath he of evil in himself, but should some urgent fate, untimely lot, bring thee to meet his shadow, nameless elf, that haunteth the lone regions where hath trod no foot of man, Command thyself to God. J. Law, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. We're just about to get up to the Raven, which will be the final poem of the evening, having done silence. I quite like silence. Silence, uh, reading that, does remind me of one of my favourite books, which is Toe Pratchett's Reaper Man. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are Toe Pratchett fans. I'm actually... I know he's massive in England. Uh, is Terry Pratchett big in America as well? And um, Amazon.com did just send me uh, the occasional email telling me I can buy Pratchett books. But but I'm, I'm not sure if you guys read Terry Pratchett. Good, you do. Yes, awesome. Well, great. Silence reminds me of Reaper Man and, and Death, uh, particularly as he's sort of working in the fields, uh, trying to get an honest living. Uh, gosh, that's an awesome book. Um, yeah, I might have to go reread Reaper Man. I, I probably won't read Reaper Man on Periscope. There might be some copyright issues there. Fortunately, Poe's been dead for a while, so we're okay there. But yeah, I might have to go back to Reaper Man. And possibly, you never know, might be able to get away with uh, grabbing all the Pratchett's up here and just reading my favourite scenes. That could be fun. That could be fun for a few tonight. Favourite scenes from Terry Pratchett books. But uh, that's a thought for another time. And in the meantime, it's always fun, always fun. Let's get started with the raven. Uh, and, and if you do know the words, or if you can just remember the words that you're reminded by the couplets, please, 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 even though I can't hear you, and it's a shame that I can't hear you, uh, see the lines if you know them, guys. Uh, on three. Three, two, one. 
Once upon a midnight weary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a <coughs> tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. "'Only this, and nothing more. "'Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, "'and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. "'Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly had I sought to borrow "'from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, this is it, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting dreams, dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what there it is at this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obedience made he, not an instant stopped or stayed he, but with mine or lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, though I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Never more. Much I marvel this ungainly fowl to her discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door, with such name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further then he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before, 
Then the bird said, Nevermore! Startled at the stillness, broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master, whose unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad into smiling, straight I wheel the cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking. Fancy not a fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head and ease, reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the light lamp gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamp light gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, never more. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by angels whose faint footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee by these angels, he hath sent thee respite, respite and a penth from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenth. And forget this lost Lenore, and quaff the raven nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate, yet all undaunted, on this desert island enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there? Is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil. Prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within that distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maid, who the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, and quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word or, or sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, get thee back into the tempest that the ninth Plutonian shore, leave no black flume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit that bust above my door, take thy beak from out my heart, take thy form from off my door, and quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeing of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him, streaming, throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. <laughs>